So we're going to keep moving along, and it really is my great, great pleasure to introduce my colleague, Dr. Susan Buchheimer. Dr. Dr. Buchheimer uh, came to UCLA in 1993 after doing an internship and being a lecturer at Yale for several years. Then she was at the NIH for four years. I think it's down there. She's a full professor at UCLA, in, um, and she's the Joaquin Fuster Professor of Cognitive Neuroscience, which is an endowed chair position. She's really one of the world's experts in brain imaging. She has over 100 publications and has been working with kids and looking at pediatric brain disorders since 1992 when fMRI became available. And it really gives me great pleasure to introduce my close colleague, Susan Buckheimer. Thank you very much, Dan. It's a great pleasure to be here, and thanks for the Grandparents Autism Network for inviting us here today and giving you an opportunity to tell you about our research and uh, what's happening now in understanding uh, the brains of children with autism and how they develop and, um, and how they are related to brain function, which is, of course, most critically important in understanding how autism develops and what we can do to treat it. So. Um, um, I'm going to refer back to some of the things that Dan talked about when we, we talk about um, genetics and how genes and their interactions with behavior will lead to autism. Um, in the past, I think we, we, we have thought, and I think the public in general will often think that we'll have sort of a direct connection between certain genes and then this outcome autism. But that's really um, not the reality that, that we believe is happening. First, genes have to go through the brain first and do whatever they're going to do before we see that outcome. But most importantly, it's not going to be the case that a single gene is going to affect the whole brain, which is going to produce the whole syndrome of autism. As Dan points out, autism is really comp composed of a series of very different phenotypes, which can affect different brain regions and can impact on different kinds of symptoms that we see in autism, which um, together, when they're all together at the same time, we'll call autism. But really, we have to break it down and look at the individual components if we really understand what's happening in the brain. Um, we'll think of these as, as distinct autism phenotypes affecting different areas of the brain. And so then what we want to, to, to talk about then is how can we identify methods for looking at the brains of children in autism while they're, they're, they're um, uh, young and living and behaving. Um, and this is uh, something that we've been able to do only in about the last 15, 16 years with the rise of certain uh, new brain imaging technologies that I'm going to talk to you about today. Um, now, one thing that we can do in autism is we can take a regular MRI scan and look at the structure of the brain. Uh, but as it turns out, for the most part, if you just look at a, at a picture of the brain based on MRI, the scans look, in fact, very similar to one another. The only finding that we've been able to pull out very consistently is that, on average, um, there may be um, a bit of an overgrowth of the brain size in autism early in life, which, which uh, t tends to decrease across the years. Um, this is an extreme case from um, Erica Shane's lab, looking at a very large brain of a child with autism on the left compared to a, a normal-sized brain uh, on the right. But in fact, there's so much variability in head size and brain size among children that you can't just look at a brain and say, oh, well, that's, that's a child that's going to grow up to have autism. We just have no way of doing that. And the brain structure doesn't really tell us that much about how this relates to autism and the symptoms and the problems that we see every day. So um, I've been working with a technology that was first developed in 1992 called functional MRI. And functional MRI is just a different approach of scanning the brain with MRI. Um, it's, it's completely non-invasive, non so we don't have to do any injections. There's no radiation. It's, it's completely safe. And the invention of this particular application of MRI has really been just this tremendous boon to pediatric research generally and autism research in particular. Because before this, we had no way of seeing how the brain was functioning uh, in children with autism or in, in any kinds of, uh, of children. So what is this technique? Well, there's a picture of an MRI scan you have on the left here. And what we do in functional MRI is we take a picture of the brain, but instead of just taking one picture, which you would normally do to look at brain structure, we take many pictures. We take a picture of the brain every couple of seconds for minutes at a time, maybe five, six, seven minutes in a row. So why would we, so that, that gives us thousands of pictures of the brain. Why would we take thousands of pictures in the brain all in a row, exactly the same picture? 
Well, it turns out that when we participate in some kind of cognitive task, let's say it's language, so here I am talking to you now, the language areas of my brain have to work a lot harder, and blood is going to flow to those language areas of the brain. And it turns out that blood has a lot of iron in it, iron is magnetic, and the MRI scanner is really just a giant magnet. And so what we can do then is we can actually measure the change in the magnetizability of blood as it flows into these regions. Um, and so what we will do in functional MRI is have children come into the scanner, perform a series of tasks, either maybe a language task and a control task where they might just be looking at some objects or even just uh, looking at a blank screen. And if we compare the brain scans when they are doing the language task to the brain scans when they're just resting, then the difference that we see is those areas of the brain that are working harder during language. And we represent this by putting nice color um, on top of the brain, as you can see here on the lower right, and those are the areas of the brain that happen to be active during this task. Um, so how do we do that? Well, we've got these very fancy um, uh, goggles over here, which are miniature, miniature televisions that fit directly over the eyes. And when you put these goggles on, it's like being in a huge widescreen TV. You can't see anything about the inside of the magnet. All you see is this beautiful virtual reality environment. We've got magnet-compatible headphones. And so we can have the children doing these tasks and never really feel that they're in a confined space because they never get to see it. So um, I'm going to talk to you about some of the different tasks and systems that we have looked at in autism um, using this kind of technology and what this has taught us about some of the differences that we're seeing at the level of the brain in children with autism and how we think that that is um, important in trying to design our treatments and look at the efficacy of our interventions. So the first phenotype, the first symptom essentially that I'm going to talk about is, um, is imitation. And I'm going to refer to this um, system in the brain called the mirror neuron system. So let me explain to you what I mean when I say mirror neurons. Mirror neurons is a class of neurons in the brain that were first discovered in the frontal cortex of, uh, of the macaque monkey. And um, they are neurons which fire during the performance of the behavior, um, but also during the observation of that same behavior in somebody else. And uh, the story behind how these neurons were discovered was um, there was, uh, and I don't know how true this story is, but it's a rumor anyway. We always tell the story. Um, in um, Witzelati's laboratory in Italy, uh, the, um, his laboratory was uh, a monkey laboratory where they were studying single unit recordings of neurons in monkeys who were reaching. So they would, do, they would record the brain while the monkey saw a raisin that he wanted to reach, and they would listen to the neurons fire as he went to, to um, grab that, that uh, raisin or the piece of banana and put it in his mouth. And there are certain neurons which fire in the brain when the monkey is about to reach for that exciting piece of food. And the story is that a graduate student walked into the lab one day eating an ice cream cone, and he, which of course you're not allowed to do in the laboratory, but that's another story. And he reached for the ice cream cone, and when he reached for the ice cream cone, the monkey's neurons started to fire. And that's pretty shocking because the monkey's not reaching for it, so why should these areas uh, why should his neurons have fired when the graduate student was reaching for food? Well, it turns out these are, are neurons that not only are anticipating and making sense of what that individual is going to do, but they also understand the meaning of somebody else's behavior by observation. And it is believed then that these neurons are very important in a couple of critical skills, particularly imitation, learning how to imitate others, um, and understanding the meaning of others' actions by internalizing them as if you were doing it yourself. So in other words, the monkey understands what that person is doing when they're reaching out because he internalizes it. If I were going to do it, that's what I would be doing. So you match the other behavior with your own behavior and you have an understanding of what is going on with another person. And that is also thought to be really the basis of empathy, theory of mind, the understanding of others and the intentions of others. So the mirror neuron system is obviously one that's very interesting to us in autism um, since imitation is so critical in uh, very early childhood. It's um, very frequently impaired in autism. Um, and the improvement in imitation is related to the rate of improvement in language acquisition, which is critically important. Um, so we think of then this mirror neuron system as being the, the basic critical system that's involved in internalizing the intentions of others and therefore understanding um, uh, uh, what is happening inside the brains of somebody else. 
So we did an experiment using functional MRI looking at imitation and observation, in this case, of emotional expressions in the brain. So the kind of thing that the kids would do is they would lie down in the scanner, they'd see faces like these with um, uh, different facial expressions, could be a smile, could be a, a, a frown, it could be a, a horror, a expression of horror, and we would have them either observe them or imitate them. And uh, we actually videotaped them making these expressions later to make sure that they were actually doing it and that they knew how to make those expressions. And these are higher functioning children with autism, so they're able to do this uh, quite well. But what happens in the brain? So these are some brain scans at the top of typically developing children, then of children with autism in the middle, and then of the difference between them below. And so what I want to alert you is to two general areas of the brain. First, I've outlined here the visual areas and the motor areas that we can see um, in both the children in autism uh, and the typically developing children. But there's another area that you can see there that's circled in the white, where um, this is in the frontal lobe, the inferior frontal gyrus, and um, it turns out this is the same area that Dan showed you earlier, where one of the areas where um, the uh, catnap gene is expressed. And this is the area of the brain that's, that's what we call the mirror neuron area. This is the same area that was shown in monkeys. This is the human um, homologue of this area. And so when they're imitating others, Yes, they show activity in the motor and visual areas, which you would expect because they're moving their faces and they're seeing these pictures, um, but they also show this area of the brain that, that are active in the mirror neuron um, system, showing that they're not just imitating the behaviors, they're also internalizing the meaning of these behaviors. And this is what we see in the typically developing children. In the children with autism, we see all the other motor areas and visual areas are exactly the same, but there's no activity in the mirror neuron areas. And this is uh, uh, an area that's also significantly different between the groups. So it's as if they're able to go through the motions of doing the behavior, but what they're not doing is internalizing and understanding the significance and the meaning of that behavior. They're not um, incorporating the part of that system that helps you to understand there's a relationship between what I'm feeling and what you're feeling. When you feel this, I know what that means because I'm feeling it as well. And um, this has important implications for other phenotypes that we can see in autism. For example, um, I'm going to show you a similar experiment that we did where what we did in this case was we modified the direction of the eye gaze. So we had scary faces like this. Um, and that's a very angry face over here. And then what we did was we brought these pictures into Photoshop and moved the eyeballs so that they either were looking like they were looking directly at you or they were just shifted just the tiniest bit as if they're off to the side. Now, this is the tiniest little manipulation, right, of what you're actually seeing. But as we all know, these kinds of emotions have a very different meaning right, if they're looking straight at you versus if they're looking at that guy over there, okay? When somebody looks at you with a very terrible ex uh, expression like that, we feel it inside. It's like we get that little feeling like somebody's angry at me and our, our anger systems start getting aroused um, and our anxiety systems start getting aroused, even though this is just a picture and there's nobody actually here to, to bother us. So looking at this in children with autism, what we found, again, um, I'm showing the, the typically developing children um, uh, first at um, when the pictures are looking at you directly and when they're averted. And what you can see, I'm showing you in uh, circled in yellow here, is that same mirror neuron area, uh, area in the frontal lobe. When you are, the eyes are looking directly at you, you get nice activity in that area. But then as soon as the eyes are just averted a little bit to the side, that activity goes away. It's, a, it's like it's like it has no meaning at all. It's as if your brain processes whether this information is significant to you, whether you need to understand what's happening in that person's brain or not. If you're looking over there, it's less relevant. If they're looking straight at you, it's more relevant. So the activity in this mirror neuron region is modulated by the significance, by the meaning of the behavior that's, that you are receiving. So this is what we see in typically developing children. And this is what we see in children with autism. And we actually measured their eye movements and their eye position to make sure that they were looking at the eyes, to make sure that they were um, uh, able to see which, which direction the eyes were, were faced. And we, we did some fancy things with the experimental design that required them to look at a focus point before the pictures went on so that we knew where their eyes are going. So even when we're very careful about controlling where the eye position is, they get the information, but it's not activating that same mirror neuron area of the brain. So what does that mean in terms of what is the information that they're receiving, right? 
Um, they can see the facial expressions. We know that because the visual activity is just the same in the brain. But the meaning of the facial expression is not modulated by the eye gaze direction. So you can think about the implications of that for a very young child. If you have a, a young child who is seeing expressions like this, but it's not activating any centers that tell you what the meaning of that is, why would you bother to look at the eyes? There's nothing interesting about the eyes if it's not conveying a special piece of information. We all look at eyes when we communicate with others because we know that those eyes are telling us something very, very important about what that person is feeling, what they're thinking, what their intentions are, what they're going to do. Um, but if, if we're not getting that aspect of the meaning of that expression, there's no point in looking at the eyes. And so you can imagine that through development, children, would not, children with autism would not understand that there's a, a particular compelling reason to look at the eyes and they don't.